and welcome to another episode of Rainbow History Class, the queer and trans history that you don't get in school for a second. I forgot what we did here. Uh, my name is Rudy Jean Rick. And my name's Hannah and it's never far from my mind what we do here. I was like queer and what? Hmm, what else could it be? Yeah, there's got to be another word that's somehow related to you. Yeah. Anyway, my name is Hannah and <laughs> um, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm excited for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. I wanted to like talk about about how I just finished an almost two year long D and D campaign on the weekend, and like how shocked I am about it, and how shocked you are looking at me right now. I have no understanding of of D and D, and I've tried for a long time. But the idea of like a single game going for many years is mm. just like wild to me. Is it like a jigsaw puzzle where you have to just? put it on a big felt mat and then keep it like all the pieces so that you don't um, forget where you were at. Not really. So, I mean, look, everyone's different and like some people do go all out where they will literally take tables like this, which we're sitting at is a massive like wooden table and they will like basically DIY the table to like have uh, a play section kind of pop out. Like imagine like a, like a mahjong table or like, um, like a poker table or something like that. Like, Oh yeah. It's like okay, designed. So it's like, yeah. 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 But like, you know, if you're like playing on a budget or whatever, like, you know, our DM or, you know, our friend who DM'd the last campaign. That's right. <laughs> DM'd is like, the term dungeon dungeon master, but I don't believe that that's like used colloquially, like used as a term anymore. As in like, I don't think it's like a really great term to use, you know, master and all the connotations that it has, but, and also dungeon master is kind of sus. Anyway, we just say DM. Yeah. It just is basically the person that is controlling, walking you through the game. The story is basically the person who is sort of saying like, okay, this is what's happening and then kind of like helping you guide through the game. Can you do one that goes for maybe like 45 minutes? No, but you can play what's called a one shot, which is like a one session and sessions can go from like two hours to like 15 hours. Could you, because I really am waiting to be, you know, inducted into D&D because I know it's so important to you and I really want to understand every facet <laughs> of your life. I am not sure, like I'm con concerned about committing for a long period of time because I might not like it. No. So I was, is there like a speed round? Like I think 45 minutes is probably like what I could sign on to. I feel like you, okay, so here's the thing. The short answer is no, it's not a 50, it's not a 20. Why am I saying all the wrong terms? Of, yeah, I literally said 45 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> it's not 15 minutes. I gave minutes. you the parameters. It's not 25 minutes. It's definitely not 45 minutes. Here's the thing. I want you to imagine where, and and, and if you're at home and you're thinking, I, I really want to get into D&D, but I don't know what the vibe is. I can only speak to like how we do things, but I'm sure like if this interests you, you can just like take it and run with it. I want you to picture this. Okay. It's a Saturday afternoon. You have um, a bundle of snacks that you're bringing or you know the person who's hosting is doing a charcuterie board. That's what we've been doing. There's going to be wine. There's going to be drinks. You know, you have breaks and things like that. It's like a book club. It's it's kind of like a book club, but you come together on a big table or in a big space. Maybe you're like using the coffee table, you're on the couch, whatever, with a group of people, a group of friends, and you basically get to sit there and have someone else go, okay, so you're in the town of uh, Melbourne and you are in this dock area and it's at nightfall. You've just walked into a bar and in the bar across the room, you see a group of people, you think to approach them. And then you kind of get guided through like the game mechanics, which I can't explain because I'm not that experienced like that way. And then you kind of just sit, get to sit there and you get to go, hmm, what would I do? And then you literally get to say what you do and you literally get to like enact what you do. Okay. Does it always have to be like a dungeon and a dragon then? Like, can you do sort of spin-offs? I mean, there's not spin-offs, but there's other games in the same genre, which is like, you know, they I mean, Star Wars has made their own version. Like you could do a Sex in the City version, literally. Like, that's what that's kind of more what I'm into. Yeah. yeah. So we could do like a Sex in the City D and D. You could, but they'd have to be like physical battles. Yeah, like, like trying to hail a New York cab. I mean, I guess. I think, you know, D and D it, it works best in like a if uh, like at least a a, a soft fantasy set, setting. Like it doesn't have to be So we could do like a queer history D and D. Yeah, we literally could. But it wouldn't be D&D &D, to be like just a, like a tabletop role play game, which is the genre. 
obviously speaking of nerd stuff, there is a lot of information that I have to impart to you today. Okay. I'm really interested in what we're talking about. Cause I, I don't really know. I just heard you listening to weird songs. <laughs> <laughs> that's true I've been listening to country music all week no surprise so um Beyonce recently released sort of that part two to her like renaissance album Cowboy Carter um which I keep accidentally calling Cowboy Carpenter <laughs> <laughs> loved, loved um some woodworking yeah I mean it just feels like more on the range <laughs> if you ask me um but then Literally days after, right? Okay, so Cowboy Carter, there's one um, song on there with Willie Nelson, all right? The, like, country music um, superstar, right? Orville Peck, who I'm very into, you know, gay cowboy, face mask, Mm. absolute icon. You know Orville? I do know him and, you know what, I'll be honest with you, I haven't really gotten into the Orville space because it's one of those things where I don't, you know, it's, a, it's like I know I'll like it, so i got to kind of keep it away a little bit because I, I, I don't totally have time. Get that. Like I don't have time. Like if I, I just need to prioritise my um, hyper fixations. So yeah, it's, no, it's a bit low on the list. I totally get that and I encourage you to reach out to me when you get to it. But I love Orville Peck. But literally days after Cowboy Carter was released, Orville Peck released a duet with Willie Nelson, right? Oh. And it was a version of Willie Nelson's song, Cowboys Are Frequently Secret... <laughs> Okay. Cowboys are frequently secretly fond of each other. Is that a vocal warm up or I think it might I think it might be. That's the name of the song. Now, if you're thinking um this is a song that sounds queer but probably isn't, I'm going to read to you from the lyrics. Please. <laughs> I'm only going to do a couple, but there's many a strange impulse out on the plains of West Texas. There's many a young boy who feels things he don't comprehend. Well, small town don't like it when somebody falls between the sexes. No, small town don't like it when a cowboy has feelings for men. Okay, love it, but why does it sound like something Trump would say at a rally? <laughs> like, yeah. is, is, can you imagine that in a Trump voice? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. No, small town don't like it when a cowboy has feelings for men. <laughs> like, just pair it back 50% on the speed and you've got tr- Trump. There's Trump. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah, so that, that's... That's very obvious. Yeah, absolutely. Now, this is um, an iconic song in the gay cowboy canon, so you can see where we're going to go with this episode. We're talking about gay cowboys. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, Willie Nelson, very old man. Okay. Yeah, uh, he is a gay advocate and has been for a long, long time. Um, I just like pulled this little quote because I thought it was really nice. But on gay marriage, Willie Nelson once said, gay people deserve to be just as miserable as the rest of us. Um, oh, amen, sister. Literally. Say it louder. Yeah. And I think um, that was, he's sort of been saying um, that kind of thing for a long time. No, he's been really fighting for um, LGBTQ plus rights. So I just thought I'd do a shout out to Willie Nelson here as like a jumping off point, knowing as well that, you know, in his age, he really kind of was a pioneer of gay rights, um, given how things have been. Let me get a pic of him. Hang on. Yeah, get a pic of him. I'm just going to look up um, Willie Nelson. Oh my God. He's 90. Holy shit. Holy shit, this guy's got, like, the the sickest plaits. Yeah, he's beautiful. He's honestly beautiful. So he's actually 90 years oh. old. So the, you know, for almost a century he's been Look fighting for our photo. rights. What a sweetie. Yeah, he's beautiful. Oh, he reminds me, like, not the same, but, like, I'm literally going to, I'm literally going to cry. I'm, like, he, why is he singing? <laughs> Yeah, he is the real deal. He kind of, I wonder, hang on, I'm diverting here, but like did he ever do anything with Jimmy Buffett? Oh, my God, please tell me they did. Please tell me, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Sorry, I'm really obsessed with Jimmy Buffett. And there they are together. There they are together. Okay, sorry. That's all right. I'm Confirmed. just going to rate. I mean, I'm just happy that you're you're happy to be here because this is, a very exciting topic. So this queer kind of country music mania has been ramping up over recent years. So you obviously you remember Lil Nas X did Old Town Road. Oh, yeah. Uh, then we obviously had Kylie, quintessential gay icon. She released Golden. Okay. 
Yeah, it was like a country inspired album that she released. Oh, was this the um the 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 little hot pants? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's kind of building on this canon, right? And then just very recently, Boy Genius. Um, oh my god! I know. Did a photo shoot paying homage to the film that shot the gay cowboy into the mainstream. Brokeback Mountain. That's exactly right. Yeah. Check out this photo shoot. It is divine. But, like, now we can talk about Broke Mount, Mount, Brokeback Mountain because I feel like that was really um, the pinnacle of the kind of mainstreamification of the gay cowboy. Yeah. Do you remember? Have you seen the film? No. <laughs> what kind of gay are you? Um, I'm the kind of gay that, like, like didn't really want to watch anything gay. I don't know. Like, it just never really interested me. I don't know why. I think it's because, like, listen, I – I mean, it's Jake Gyllenhaal on a ranch. It's Anne Hathaway. <sighs> okay, I'm telling you. Okay, listen. Okay, here's the thing. I think I didn't really want to watch it because as a young teenager, and my mum can attest to this, I was, like, very anti-romance. Like, I hated, like, Dear John, The Notebook. Like, I just thought it was like, oh, like oh. you know, so anything that kind of reeked of, like, sincere love, I just was like, no, thanks, not for me. I will watch my silly little robot films, actually. I mean, I see what you yeah. mean. I, it's not like I was gagging over Dear John or The Notebook, but the idea of that but two men really got me because there was, there was no representation of, of anything like that. Okay. I think I was a, a very young teenager when it came out mm. and I went to see it and I was absolutely – Flawed. First of all, I'd never seen any representation of like sex between men on screen ever. Mm. So I was hooked. Uh, obviously, I thought it was hot, beautiful, devastating, all of these kind of feelings. And I was just enamored with this film so much so that I like did a soft pastel artwork rendition of the film's promotional artwork. Do you still have it? I do because I made my mum. Hang it in the hallway. Is it still up? No, she she was really happy when I said that she could take it down. She was like, it's a great piece of art. It's a weird thing to ha- like hang in the hallway of a family home. Mm. Um, however, I still have it and it's pretty good. I want to see this. Can you I'm going to show you. Yeah, yeah I'm going gonna, gonna to show you. Anyway, so that was like Brokeback Mountain. So basically what I wanted to do running through this kind of uh, different steps in the canon of like pop cultural gay cowboys is establish that it is a thing. Mm. Now, the idea and the iconography of a, of a homoerotic cowboy has, you know, existed since the, you know, since the time of the cowboys, mostly in porn, queer scenes, you know, yeah. things around um uh, you know, around the margins, around the fringes of of popular culture, but this is obviously changing. Now, I do love gay. I I do love cowboys because I also just wanted to do a little brag because I am related to a country music star. Who? You know, Jeff Jeff Mack is his name. He wrote the song "I've Been Everywhere, Man." Really, yeah. I've been everywhere, man. That guy. That guy. How related are you? Like, you just drank from the same cup one time? Or? No, like I used to hang out with him when I was little. He is like my great uncle. Cool. And yeah, Rihanna sampled or covered, like took a sample of it. And Johnny oh. Cash did a cover of it. Oh, cool. Right. And recently I was at the Orville Peck show in Melbourne and he shouted out to Jeff Mack. Oh. Right. And did like a short cover of I've Been Everywhere, Man. And when I tell you, I screamed the forum down. I can imagine. It's, you- the, it's like family pride. Yeah. I can imagine you like clamoring, like, ah, ah. <laughs> You know, you're not wrong. I clamored. I clamored. You're a big clamorer. I was like, oh, everyone. That's, yeah. that. And then I was like, no one cares, but that's my great uncle. Yeah. I was like, ah. Oh, my God. Uh, he came to barbecues at my house when I was little. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, that's basically what I wanted to do to set this up today mm. is talk about um, just incredible. To, like, I just wanted to do a brag. And then I also wanted nepo to. Nepo baby. <laughs> yeah, I am a nepo <laughs> baby. Yeah, you know, check the analytics of this, all that. That's my familial credentials yeah. coming through. Uh, no, so I wanted to, like, look at the historical context of the gay cowboy because, you know, it's 
it's sort of something that's really fetishized. And I think a lot of people think that that's because often with like super masculine um, figures, there is like a very, very fine line between kind of the most masculine depictions of a man and then the most homoerotic depictions mm. of the man. As soon as kind of you sort of see, you know, um, rippled muscles and kind of mm. like ripped denim, all of a sudden you're, you know, you're in a gray area. Yeah, it's cowboy boots, a set of spurs and a holster. Yeah, exactly. Else. We're going to get into chaps. <laughs> Not even the chaps. Leave the chaps at the door. Yeah. Take the holster on. There's a lot, um, there's a lot happening, right? And I think people just think, you know, because there's something taboo about, you know, the masculinity, you know, of being a cowboy and then taking that to the other extreme by making that cowboy kind of homoeroticized. But there's actually heaps of context that we can set here mm. and so much more to it than just a uh, hot cowboy looking kind of gay. So we need to go back to where so much queer history starts. That's colonization. Yep. And we are in America, in North America, settlers from Britain. They arrived in New England in the East, okay? And we've done uh, a few episodes <laughs> of old New England. Oh, at this point we've got a visit. We actually do yeah. see the birthplace of the public universal friend. This is the area where the settlers, well, settled. And so. Really? Yeah. I know. You'd be surprised. <sighs> So we're in the 1800s um, at this point and there started to become this philosophy called Manifest Destiny, which I knew from a Jamiroquai song. Wait, which one? Manifest Destiny. Oh. Long before I knew about it as a deeply racist line of thinking. Oh, yeah. Like, have you seen the headdresses that guy wears? <laughs> I, I definitely have. <laughs> um, so there was this philosophy called Manifest Destiny mm. uh, and it that was uh, – well, the term manifest destiny um, originated in the 1800s, but the concept of it goes back further. What? You're going to say something. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. TikTok girlies would love this. Oh, they would. Oh, yeah. We created manifestation. No, you didn't. Sit down. No, you didn't. You know who did? Racist colonizers. All right. <laughs> Do you want to be associated with a racist colonizer, Chantel? I don't it's always think you do. It's always Chantel. Exactly. I feel like the first time I encountered the phrase manifest destiny was in this Jamiroquai song because I am a, you know, I have been a Jamiroquai super fan. And yeah, I too. thought, oh, that sounds kind of nice. Like there's something nice about manifest destiny. It's got a nice sound to the phrase and it just feels really hopeful. It's definitely not hopeful by modern standards, but back in the 1700s when this concept was starting to uh, take shape, it was really hopeful. And essentially what it was was this idea that there was this American exceptional exceptionalism. So these Puritans uh, that came out to North America and settled in New England, they were high on the fervor of God. Oh, it was rattling through their bones. Absolutely. They were vibrating with like the thought that God was with them. And they were there as these brave, uh, God-fearing pioneers who were finding a new land, one that wasn't even in the Bible, and they were going to, you know, lay down their roots mm. and take the word of God to the people that were there. Yeah. Okay, so that was what they really wanted to do. And Manifest Destiny was all about pushing westward and, you know, colonising, continuing the westward colonisation of America uh, in a way that, you know, civilised. And for anybody listening to the audio, <laughs> the audio only version, I'm doing big um, air quotes here. Yeah. Uh, civilize the indigenous populations, you know, introduce them to God uh, and do what God wanted, <laughs> which is fundamental to um, the point of America. Like, I mean, I don't know. I just, when you say it, like, it, like introduce them to God, it's like, all right, everyone, just settle down. We've got a really special guest today. Put your hands together for God. Like, Think <laughs> okay, you're not wrong. And I have to tell you that on the weekend I was at an event and I indulged too hard in wine. <gasps> I know, get this. So I was I was at an event and it was it was 
a wedding and I got slaughtered is the only way that you could put it. Yeah, I got slizzard. Uh, The next morning I wake up very, very kind of not super well. I sort of stumble out of this apartment we were staying at. Um, You know, my partner and I, we were like, we need to eat something. I do not feel like eating anything. We cross the road and I say, I don't feel like anything on this menu. Hannah, my partner, is like, you have to eat something. So I said, okay, the waffles. Mm. She said, please, please, please don't eat ice cream at this hour in your state. I, I think ice cream would he- cure me. I had been puking. Oh, uh, yeah, no. And I said, fine. So I ordered this smoothie bowl. and A smoothie bowl. I know, because I thought it had banana, which had potassium in it. It might be good. It was kind of like ice cream. And it arrives covered in papaya. That slimy bullshit excuse for a fruit. I know it's nature's vomit. So then I'm sitting there eating this smoothie bowl and I'm looking at, you know, Hannah, like I'm not okay. And I realized that she's <laughs> not focusing on me. And that's because she said to me, they have played religious rock music for the last three songs here. Mm. I start looking around. I'm seeing big signs that saying amen. Mm. And I have in my worst state, I would never want to show up to the Lord like this. I've wandered into the local church and ordered a smoothie bowl. Is it like a church come cafe? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. You weren't in your Sunday best. I was, I couldn't have been in, I was in my Sunday worst. Oh my, anyway. oh my God. No, you know what? I actually, uh, there's, uh, uh, oh my God. I think I know exactly the cafe. Where was this? This is in Hillsville. Yes. I know the exact cafe that you're talking about and I can attest it was a freaky experience. <laughs> this one, was it with the, um, like the mezzanine up the top? Yep. Oh my God. The, that place. God bless them because they make some delicious food. But I will say hungover, not the place to be. No, hungover in your gay relationship, like stumbling in, trying to, you know, Avoid bright lights and any kind of smell. Oh, uh, no, it is like a sensation bomb. It's a spiritual bomb. It was. It, it's a lot going on in I that place. I had a spiritual experience <laughs> and not a good one. Oh, my God. Um, but, I, you know, I certainly digress. But basically the Puritans came over. <laughs> they came over and they enacted Manifest Destiny. That was kind of what they were driven to do is kind of push west, continue the colonisation um, and, you know, yeah, essentially whatever the hell they did. They were um no, there's no jokes to be made. There was some doing there was some doing they were doing some dog awful shit. Absolutely. Like. They were. They were. And I think this was like I want to just, you know, orient us in time. This was the second half of the 19th century. So it's a 18 kind of 1840s onwards. Mm. And what this um area or period of time, it was kind of like part of place, part of period, the was called the American frontier. You know, I think we've all heard the term American frontier. This is what we're sort of talking about. Now, it was really dangerous for these Puritans. Firstly, you know, anyone that's been to North America um, and has gone through the Midwest, it's a very um, unforgiving landscape. In Australia, we're kind of used to that. Um, But for people from, say, England with its uh, rolling fields of green, it was a harsh reality. Oh yeah. They and they had to go from New England, which was, you know, very, very extreme temperatures through to very dry, um, desert, you know, uh, desert environments. So it was really dangerous. That was okay because the Puritans were pretty good at suffering. You know, that was the whole point of being, you know, Puritans mm. was the idea of kind of foregoing all kinds of luxuries or comforts, um, in service of God. And so, you know, they had this idea that, their ancestors who did come over on those first kind of boats, the Mayflower, et cetera, um, you know, they suffered. So the idea of suffering, it was a torch of suffering that was that wow. was passed, right? Or generational trauma, but call it what you want, I guess. Essentially, a torch of suffering sounds just kind of, sounds better. It sounds like a cult I want to be a part of. <laughs> the torch of suffering. <laughs> yeah. Um, many of them died. Uh, Hang on, you just said they were okay. No, I said that they were. And now they died. I didn't. I said they were good at suffering. I didn't say it ended well. You said, but they were okay. Yeah, they were okay with the fact that they suffered. 
why? I it's, like these are very religious people, so like death is not feared among them because they are moving onwards. Like the fact that they were suffering <laughs> and then died. Oh, but that's okay. It didn't suck for them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Glad we cleared that up. <laughs> uh, this is what happens when we record in the evenings. Okay? Hang on. This is what I've got. We say that when we record in the mornings. <laughs> we should just record it midday. Yeah, we should. Maybe then we'll be boring though. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so that was man- Manifest Destiny was one reason that people started moving west. There were actually other reasons. So life in New England was pretty restrictive. Uh, it was puritanical, if you will, uh, named for the crew that set it up. They were, it was a very kind of restrictive, um, highly kind of surveilled society. So the idea of the West and this American frontier that embodied freedom and new opportunities. So there was a lot of kind of motivation for people to head West. There was also in 1848, gold rush. All right. So there was this like kind of promise of gold and then the advent of ranching. So kind of mm-hmm. economic mm-hmm. opportunities were a big draw card for a lot of people. So yeah. the ones that weren't doing it kind of for, for their religious reasons, um, they were doing it for like economic opportunity. Mm-hmm. Then some more. So the first misconception I think that surrounds the the depiction of the modern day cowboy is that it's nearly almost a white man. And this is where the Beyonce um, kind of commentary comes out. A lot of people are saying, you know, Beyonce is doing, ca- you know, country music and sort of there's been a lot of conversation around, oh, hang on, um, country country music and cowboy culture is very, very tied to black history. It is, In the United yeah. States, it absolutely is. Cowboys were overwhelmingly not white. In fact, 25% of cowboys on the American frontier were estimated to be African-American. Yeah, well, it's like, um, you know, you know, when they were making all the cowboy movies, like they were just racist so they were not putting people of colour in there, you know, in the film. So, like, of course, if that's your first experience of, like, uh, you know, seeing what cowboy life was like, then, yeah, the, like, critical, like, piece of, like, disinformation being spread is that, like, all cowboys are white. Absolutely. And, like, you know, that's 25% African American. There were a whole lot of Indigenous cowboys as well, you know, as well as kind of other, I guess, other cowboys from Mexico or South America. Um, So you're actually looking at the majority, the likely majority of cowboys on the American frontier being non white. Yeah. Um, So I think that's one misconception. Now, a lot of these African-American uh, cowboys were people escaping um, plantations in the South and then later in like from like 1870, um, the Jim Crow laws in the South. That's kind of painting a bit more of a diverse picture of life on the frontier. Many of these cowboys were also born female. Whoa. I know. So there was the real life Calamity Jane. Yeah. Yeah. So her name was, they don't really know her definite actual name, but it was most likely Martha Jane Canary. Cool. Yeah. And she was born in 1856. I reckon she, like, if her and Joan Jett were around together, like, they'd be, they'd be like. Pretty much like. Yeah. Yeah. Calamity Jane was the Joan Jett of the frontier. That's sick. Um, So her parents died when she was young which meant that she was an orphan and needed to make money doing odd jobs. I think there's like a lot of myths that came up around her kind of daredevil nature. You know, this idea of her kind of like smoke and shooting, drinking, swearing, kind of salooning kind of thing. And there is truth to that. However, you know, most likely how she kind of got there was the fact that she was a sex worker and being a sex worker on the frontier was a pretty good. Oh, yeah. Like that, yeah, hell yeah. I, just a question though, because now we've like, you've set the scene and thank you for like showing us how we got to the ranching. Where, what period of time are we, are the, is this sort of happening? So 1800s. 1800s. Okay, yeah, so and, still... it, and it continued, I guess, very early 1900s, but really what we're talking about is the second half of the 1800s. Wait, and just because like I'm tired, 1800s is like 1750. No. I'm so confused. 
19th century is the 1800s. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, so you're saying the 18th and 19th century. No, no, no. I'm saying the 1800s. 100s. Oh, okay. The second yeah. half of them. So from about like 1860. Think, think about 1850 to 1900. Great. Okay, cool. Because I was just like. Hang on, am I supposed to be like translating what you're no. saying? Okay. Cool. No, no, no. I'm just speaking the plain truth here. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, being a sex worker at this time was really good considering um, you know, if you were married off to a man, you had to do a lot of housework and raise a lot of children and have sex with your husband and you probably didn't want to. At the time on the frontier, sex workers were able to choose their clients and they got to make money. So they had a lot more autonomy. And it was here that Calamity Jane actually learnt to smoke and drink and shoot and uh, all of those types of things because she learnt from the men that she was seeing um, as clients. She also started to wear male clothing um, and then really kind of took on that, um, I guess, tomboy ideal that we see her in in that movie Calamity Jane Mm, mm. um she was really a performer so she like you know loved doing those sort of old western performances and traveling and things like that and so she had this real swagger about her and that's kind of how we get this Calamity Jane um and of course you know to like further cement her into I guess queer history there was this song Secret Love in the film Calamity Jane which was you know highly queer coded Um, I haven't said anything about Calamity Jane's uh, gender identity or sexuality because nothing is known except for the fact that we do know that at some point she really eschewed traditional female dress and started presenting, you know, wearing male clothing. Yeah, for sure. But she never changed her name or anything like that. So a lot of, for like a lot of um, women, moving west was really exciting as well. So you know how we've spoken about Boston marriages Yeah. Yeah. So Boston marriages or these romantic friendships between women, while they were very normalized in New England and it was okay, it's not like they could, it's not like these two women could go and kind of have a lot of freedom. Um, It still had to be very, or their romance had to be very kind of undercover. So you've got a lot of Boston marriages or kind of these romantic friendships, essentially two women in a romantic relationship with each other heading west for the freedom as well and also the opportunity to actually work and, you know, get on a ranch. Yeah. Which is cool. What would you call a Boston marriage that's like a cowboy marriage, like a ranch marriage, Uh, like a... Yeah, like like a a ranch and ship. A ranch and ship, yeah. Uh, Like... um, West Friends. Yeah, that's good. That's that's a good one. Wait, there's one on the tip of my tongue. It's not there anymore. I'll, I'll rain check that. I got to I got to I got to take it back to the workshop. Okay, okay, that's fair. And then I also want to let you know about somebody else. So there's there was a cowboy called mm. Harry Allen. He was notorious on the frontier. He was a massive ladies man, so much so that uh four of his girlfriends died by suicide, oh. leaving these kind of like notes of suicide notes of broken heartedness. Oh my God. I know. I know. So whether or not that shows him as a, he's often described as a ladies man, emotionally abusive. Maybe what? I don't know. No, it's ladies, man. You got to stay away from him. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I think so. Oh my God. But um, he was, he was trans and found to be trans um, much later. He was arrested for sort of a range of like infractions. One of them was like white slavery because uh, he kind of crossed state lines with um, his girlfriend who was also a, um, a sex worker. And then another thing, another one where he sort of sold alcohol, I believe, to an Indigenous man. Um, so that was a crime back then as well. So he ended up in the legal system, um, but he was a trans man cool, um, and really kind of was able to kind of flex his, his masculinity and his freedom um, in this environment. And I just think it's cool because we never hear about trans cowboys. Yeah. And trans cowboys that drive four of their girlfriends to death. <laughs> yeah. What an interesting complex fellow. You know what? I think that's the thing. It's like... <laughs> You know, we we like to learn about these people, but you know, 
Some of them are a bit shit. Some of them are a bit shit. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of times from queer history, you're like, yes, I can't, oh, no. Yeah. Nice that we know about you. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things. That's why I'm like, some people always say, who's your inspiration? Who's your favorite icon from queer history? I'm like, no one's safe. It's me. I'm my own icon. <laughs> Be your own and icon. Me? I can tell you straight up, very flawed. Yeah, but, you know, in like a couple of centuries from now, people will look back and be like, well, there was this kid called Rudy Jean Rigg. (laughs) Uh, The mullets they had? Problematic. Problematic. Deeply problematic. Yeah. I just wanted to give you that little tidbit. As for the other cowboys, which will bring us back to kind of our first section where we're talking about kind of cowboys who are secretly fond of one another. (laughs) The, the we always thanks to the you know the cigarette advertising you know seeing that kind of lone ranger uh cowboy Lucky that's a little strikes. yeah it's yeah. a little misleading because typically cowboys would always travel in pairs this was because again it was dangerous there was the terrain there were frequent kind of attacks or clashes with you know the indigenous groups and i think that for that reason they always traveled in in pairs and often in these these pairs there was sex now sometimes this was you know accepted sex between men given a lack of women it was all really accepted because it was you know needs must situation but often there was a lot of romance between these partners and I think there was a bit of a blurring between a romantic kind of relationship between two men sometimes there it was platonic but there was sex other times it was romantic and there was sex other times it was like platonic and sort of romantic at the same time You know, so I think that is something that was very, very common. Mm. Often these men were referred to as confirmed bachelors. Whoa, what? Yeah, which is one of those like kind of 1800s um, (laughs) kind of like Boston marriage or like roommates or, Uh. you know, I... He was a confirmed bachelor. That was sort of what they said at the time as a colloquialism kind of shorthand for, you know, being gay in in a sense. Hey, partner, you a confirmed bachelor? Essentially. Oh my God. Yes. Oh, that is so like kind of pot, like kind of tight lipped, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It was very kind of that language akin to when, you know, you'd read in the history books, he never married. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. So this was really, really common and there was no reason for, you know, when this did happen for cowboys to feel any any sort of shame or like otherwise consequences about this because manpower was in really high demand so it's not like it was hard to get jobs but you know when we're thinking backwards about that westward kind of push from from New England that was kind of that colonial stronghold on you know the US and so as that started to kind of emanate outwards that colonial idea of gender came with it Mm. and as their you know grew in population throughout the West, they took with them, you know, those kind of gendered ideals um, and those very religious, rigid ideas of kind of, yeah, multiple genders. Because again, we're talking about things like there were a lot of, you know, Indigenous cowboys, you know, they could have been sort of third gender. Uh, There was a lot more fluidity Mm. there. So it's kind of, it was really just through the process of colonization that 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 started to change and, you know, shame was bought over. (laughs) Um, to the West from the East. Suffering. Yeah. It's like if you're not suffering, then you're not living really. Exactly. And that was the Puritan, uh, the Puritan spirit. Yeah. To suffer is to live. What is that? Fall Out Boy song? <laughs> <laughs> get, no, nah, don't worry. It's, it's kind of, I don't know. It just came into my head. It's called Get Busy Living or Get Busy Dying. It, it completely not. To me, that is the ethos of the American frontier. Yeah. Um, so as society, you know, became more industrialized. You know, there was this idea of progress. Everything was developing very rapidly. Uh, You know, landowners at the time could become a little bit more choosy with who they hired. And, you know, there was that idea of like morality and sexuality coming into play. So a lot of these um, romantic or sexual or partnerships between cowboys were sort of forced into secret, um, which brings us to the kind of scenario we saw in Brokeback Mountain. Mm. So, yeah, that's kind of like the historical backing for the phenomenon of the gay cowboy. That is so interesting. I love that, you know, because it's like I I often like, you know, and this is something I've not done and I I kind of should do is like look up like illustrations, whatever, like 
cameras back then? Anyway, like probably not. But like anyway, like kind of just like I can't believe every time I forget when a camera was made, I always think back to my first ever media exam. You had to pass a whole section about like history of like cameras to literally be like allowed into the course and I always forget now after the stress of that exam. Anyway, all I know about the Wild West is like Westworld and um, that one episode of Bob's Burgers that's just in the most current season and like kind of that like uh, once upon a time in Hollywood they were on that like cowboy set. Like that's kind of how I imagine it or like Red Dead Redemption, another one. Yeah, yeah, Like is yeah. that like I, I want to know and there's probably video essays on this like how accurate like for example Red Dead is. Red Dead apparently more accurate. I've not read I've not played that. Yeah. Though my partner's played it a lot. But that is more historically accurate. Okay. Maybe I should play that. Than like your classic Clint Eastwood film. Yes. For sure. Yeah. I think that's the thing. There are sort of more accurate depictions. And I think there are plenty of photos. You know, we can put some of these on social of these cowboys of the time to give you a bit more of a sense of what it was like. I think unfortunately, you know, into there's the lucky strike um cowboy that's kind of takes over our imagination or you know I guess a lot of that early to mid 20th century American kind of um depictions of cowboys Mm. but essentially yeah there's just something kind of eternally evocative about um you know the macho nature of life on the range and the soft romantic love of two confirmed bachelors (laughs) Uh, I, you know what? I love, thank you for telling me this. And I I love, I love cowboy like stuff. Like I just am really into it. I don't know why. Like, you know, I, I feel like I learned a lot from what you told me now. And like I just said, I don't really have a good actual cultural understanding, but I just love the sort of the slow life. Like, and I don't know why cowboys to me sort of have this slow life vibe to them, but like, I just kind of love the whole concept of like, how to pull her. Yeah, we're cooking some beans for dinner. You want some? Like, I don't know. It kind of just gives like, you know, got a little piece of straw in your mouth. Got like a Stetson on. You know, I love cowboy boots. Like catch me out with some cowboy boots on for sure. Hey, it's Rudy. Just, what? You want to do a cowboy D&D? Oh, my God. We actually probably could. It probably does exist. Yes. Oh, I my God. It. Yeah, maybe okay. I'd be into that. I hope you're listening to this. Just it's throw my two cents in. I hope you're listening to this. And you go away and you go and find a great pair of secondhand cowboy boots and you start calling your partner a confirmed bachelor and you, you know, indulge in the cowboy way, in like the good cowboy way, not the bad cowboy way. I think so. I think so. I hope that as well. If you want to stick with us um, as we continue the our journey into the queer history frontier um, <laughs> on this podcast. You can follow along. Where, I mean, I guess they can, but like where though? Well, that's why I looked at you, but I, oh, I was going to say. <laughs> I was making eye contact with you. <laughs> on socials and, of course, Patreon. Yeah, yeah. Like I feel like um, we. I checked our stats on, on Spotify actually. Apparently Spotify loves showing our podcast to people um, in the Explore page. So if you are like sitting here going like this was great, but like what what, what did I just like experience and you want to know what we actually look like, please head to our Instagram and our TikTok. On Instagram we're a lot more chatty and whatnot, but then if you do want to go the extra mile, we do have a Patreon, you know, just to sort of hint some stuff in the works. We are working on a Discord um, which is really exciting. So that, uh, you know, we hope to be like a really great community hub. So keep an eye out for that. But yeah, thanks for listening and Thank listening you. all the way through. And as we always say, not everything is gay, but there is gay in everything, including a pair of old chaps. Mm-hmm.